Okay, my name is JJ Merevelo. Uh, I'm JJ, J Merevelo in Sipan. Thank you very much for being here. This is what I'm going to talk about. This is actually a drawing made by Paula, who was a student uh, in my class th this year, in an um, undergraduate class. She's representing pretty much the feeling of my students when they were submitting their assignments to, to the system. So this is a continuous integration system. It was a scanning, and they were holding for their life to GitHub, just waiting for the, for the assignments to, to get through. Okay, uh, I'll speak up. This is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about testing for testing. So I'm a professor in the university. I'm not going to name the university. I'm not very proud of my university right now. So let's just say I'm in academia. Uh, and uh, I'm talking about my experience of using uh, continuous integration in the, in the classroom. Right? I'm also in Granada, in Granada, but by the way, we are going to have a workshop, a pair workshop in Granada in a couple of weeks. So if you love going to southern Spain, you know, warm, nice place, it's going to be an incredible place. The uh, call for paper is still open. If you're interested, just let me know. This is what, I, what I'm, I have been doing. It's a cloud computing class. It's an undergraduate and also master level cloud computing class. This is my actual class. So that's me. So uh, This is not the, the class I have been giving this year. It was last year. Uh, in, in the undergraduate class, I'm having around 40 students, something like that. In the master's class, I'm having around 12, 15 so it's, it's, it's a smallish class. It's not, it's not it's too small, but it's smallish. And I'm using something called flip learning. Have you ever heard about this? Never? So it's learning as people actually learn. So it, it, there is a saying, old saying that goes, you don't teach, people learn. So I think that it's, it's pretty stupid for someone to be standing in front of a class for two hours flipping slides like I'm doing now. <laughs> but the thing is that what, what you have to do for people to actually learn is to make people learn, autonomous learning. So you, you, you give them a, a series of objectives, you give them material, you, you give them some, some class notes or whatever, and then you let them learn. And you are there guiding them, helping them, or whatever. So it's not like I'm standing in front of the class for two hours. It's like I say, I, I put a slide with the set objectives of, of, the, of the particular session or, or the week, and then I wander around the class telling people, who are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, do, do you have anything to ask? Do you have any problem? I see them working with, uh, with the material of the class. I say, okay, I, I see you are stumbling onto this. Please check that out, whatever. So it's, it's a different way of giving class. That's not, that's not really related with, with, with the rest of the thing, but I just wanted to put you a little bit in context. So it, it's, it's a different way of teaching. Uh, as far as I know, there's not many people in my university who's doing that. There's not many people in other universities who are doing that. For, for me, it's, it's been just wonderful. And I keep asking the students what, whether they want this kind of class or, or what is called magistral class, the, the traditional one. And they keep saying 90% of them, no, no, we want this way of giving class. Of course, they, they can wander around. They can get in class at whatever time they want. They can get out whenever they want. So it's, uh, I mean, for them it's quite relaxed, it's not so stressful, it's nice. And then another thing I wanted to do is to, to be as real as possible. So I don't want to, to give them assignments which are just boilerplate things where they have to fill in the blanks and they say, okay, this is okay. So they, they eventually end up uh, filling the blanks and, and, and not learning anything at all, but trying to make the thing as real as possible. So not like these astronauts who are in, in a carnival parade, but real people doing real deployments in the cloud, because it's what I'm teaching, right? It's cloud computing. So at the end of the day, they will have to, to go to a, to a company or, or whatever, or to, to get their own company, and they will have to do deployments in the cloud. So I want them to do real deployments in the real cloud, right? I think that class is, is going to be a metaphor for real life. So when they will do deployments in the cloud, and when, where, when they are developing, so, uh, developing software in a company, they're going to undergo code reviews, they're going to use continuous integration. They're going to do all kind of shit that you're doing in, in, uh, in real life. But why not use it, use it in class, right? So in, in class, you will have to use code reviews. You will have to, to have continuous integration, all that kind of thing, right? Then I use GitHub. I've been using GitHub for a long time. So like, like I think like four years or so, I mean in class. Yes, please. You're going to ask something? 
Ah, okay. So GitHub is my uh, learning management system. So everything they do, it's in GitHub. That's absolutely amazing and it's very nice. Uh, so this is the actual page they use for turning in the assignments. So what they have to do is they, they have all the their stuff in a repo, such like this one. This, this is the actual page that I have been using this year in master class. So they, they, they put their, their project. They do milestones in a project. Ito means, means uh, it's not here. Yeah, uh, somewhere. Ito is milestones, so they do milestones in a project. And this, uh, they submit each milestone. When they are going to submit the milestone, what they do is they, they change this particular file, which is in my repository, it's in a repository in class, and they add their, uh, the direction of the repository, it's always, uh, it's always the same, and also the version, right? Uh, the version is important, we, we'll see that later on. GitHub is very good, it's amazing. It's much better than any other LMS you may think of. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking uh, about this because I think that everyone, at one point of your life or another, you're going to be a teacher, you're going to teach something. Um, since we are in technology, since we are in programming, we will probably have to do something like this. We'll have to, you know, onboard uh, new people in our company. We will just, you know, we are between jobs and we go to some community college to, to give class, whatever. It's something that you have to do. So uh, m my intention was to, to use this kind of technology and to see uh, uh, what kind of things could be done to make your experience a little bit better. So I have been doing this for, for as I said, quite a long time. So uh, the people were turning in the assignments, and I, I was checking out this page, and I was correcting. All of a sudden, I had a new beginning, 2017. You probably know that I was director of the Free Software Office in the University of Granada. That took me around 25 hours a day, 25, 26 hours a day. I was fired. I still keep my job as a, as a, as a professor because uh, I mean, Free Software Office was, was a, an appointment, it wasn't a job. All of a sudden, I had a lot of time in my hands. At the same time, that appointment implied a reduction in the number of uh, classes I had to eat. So before, I had a teaching assistant, a TA, right? All of a sudden, I had no TA at all. So I needed to do all, all the things that, that my TA was doing, my teaching assistant was doing. And then I thought, Continuous integration to the rescue. I'm going to use continuous integration, right? So I'm going to use the milestones as code review. So I'm actually going to review what people are, are sending, right? I was doing that a little bit before, but not very extensively. Basically, what I was doing, it was checking that there was no conflict. So when people were modifying the file, they were not conflicting with each other. Maybe if I saw something coming very, very early, I took a look at it and told them, maybe you should do it this way or that way. But all of a sudden, remember, I have, I, I have no TA, so the TA was checking things, so I said, hmm, prayer is my TA check. <laughs> so I was using prayer for doing continuous integration, right? All the checks that were done before by the, by the teaching assistant, I'm going to do, is, uh, to, do, to do it using continuous integration, which I wasn't using before. So that meant that before, I was doing uh, uh, people were doing pull requests, I accepted all of them, except if there was some conflict. Now I was doing something completely different. I was writing tests for what people were submitting, right? So, might fly or not? It says, all checks have failed, I'm not accepting that pull request. So, that means that the student has to go back to his repository and, and fix whatever is, uh, was being done before, right? What are we checking? It's important. Uh, take into account that uh, the, the product is completely free. So it, it's, uh, they, they can use whatever language they want. It's not boilerplate. It's absolutely not boilerplate. In fact, people were using, uh, most of them were using Python. But even the people who were using Python, they were using different frameworks because what they had to do was to deploy a web service to, to, the, to the cloud. Some of them were using Flask. Some of them were using Hug. Uh, some other people were using uh, Node.js and they were using Express. Some other people were using Ruby, and they were using either Sinatra or Cuba. I think that, I'm not sure. I think that both of them were using, one of them was using Go, no framework at all. So I had all kinds of different languages. I didn't have to look at, at whatever they were doing, but the effect, the actual effect, the real thing. So if you're deploying a, a web service, I want to see if it's working, right? So what do we check? The first thing, and this is quite important, is that the assignment is, you have only modified a single line in the file. 
because they had to modify a file, and sometimes what they did, you know, they, they stumbled, or sometimes they had an old version of the file, so they changed things and they, they, they submitted a, a, the, the wrong file. So I had to check that actually there was only one row in the table you have seen before that was being modified, right? So I could extract a single URL from that, from that thing. And that, that's the first thing, thing to check. So if, if they had a wrong version of the file or whatever, it was, uh, it was caught right here. And so that the repo URL is correct. So it's a, it's a GitHub uh, repository and it's actually correct. So people sometimes submit something, you know, with, with typos or whatever, and it's not working. So that's the second thing I have to check, if it's actually correct. I do it with pair, right? This is the, fir the first thing I do. Uh, uh, it's the first test uh, that they are passing. So first thing is I use this, this Git uh, module, which is, it's a weird thing because it comes with Git, but it's also in Cpan. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a module that's called Git, and. And what I do is I get a diff, so I get a diff between the, the previous version of the file and the, the, the version I have now. I check that it's only one line, right? And then I also check that they have modified the correct file, all kind of things. If, if it, doesn't, it doesn't follow that, uh, that regular expression, they fail. But if it follows the regular expression <coughs> from the diff file, I ex extract the information on the repository that I'm going to check later on, right? Uh, right now, the, the only thing I'm using is this git. Second thing, is, is it a single line? That, that's important, because if it's not a single line, there's something wrong with the, with the file. There might be a, a conflict. There, there is a, another subtle error that is on time. Uh, they change the codification of the file. So when they, when they get the file, they edit it. Sometimes they change this codification from Latin 1 to UTF-8. UTF, UTF or the other ground, so they change the whole file. That happens quite a lot, and I have, I have been, uh, sometimes I have had to fix the whole file, and it's been quite, quite, quite really bad. The worst thing was to find out who was guilty for that, and you know, maybe take up some credit or whatever. But important thing is, is it a single line? So are they modifying a single line? Because uh, that, that, that's kind of a sanity check. And then, of course, you have to download the repo, because this is all being done in, in, in let's say the class repository, it's a, it's a single repository that contains the, the check and everything, then I have to download the repo and then start to do things on them. So uh, I'm using the, the, the system git, uh, I'm using Travis, so, so there's a git there, I mean it, it's installed already, and well I start the user, the name, uh, I, I put everything into a temporary directory, it's Travis, so uh, I mean it doesn't really matter what, what happens. Uh, I think about using something, something else uh, next year, but uh, we'll see. And then eventually uh, we, we create the repository uh, and we, we start to get all the files in the repository using uh, git commands, right? So far so good? Follow with me, any question so far? Okay. Then I'm using test more. Very simple test uh, uh, module. You know it already, you probably have used it. Uh, I could probably use something else, but I didn't want to, to put more things into the Travis because just imagine people are physically waiting for, for the outcome of, of, the, of the thing to, to get out. So uh, the, more, uh, the more modules I use, the more they have to wait. And sometimes I wait too. So I, I get an email telling me that somebody has done a pull request, and then I go there to see if it's working or not. If it's not working, I, I try to, to uh, guide them to, towards doing it a little bit. But basically, uh, those, two, those two things are the, the only pair modules I use for the time being, right? As I said, I am using Travis. It's a, uh, relatively simple configuration file. Ah, it's not going to, be, to get any better. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, below that, it's only proof dash c. The only thing it does is it installs test more, test harness, git, uh, file slurp, and some, some other modules. It does prove. Because the test is included in the repository. It's not some external test. So the, the, the file that they are going to modify to make uh, to some uh, submit assignment and the, uh, uh, and the test, the, it's, it's a single script, it's right there, right? So they start to check. This is the actual history, build history, so you see milestone four, fail, fail, pass, 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 fail, right? So they submit it, it fails sometimes, 
sometimes it, it goes, goes ahead. Of course, uh, when that happens, if I'm uh, available, uh, I see it and say, okay, it, it looks like this, this is the thing that, that has failed. Take into account that I write the name of the test. So sometimes I realize that the name, uh, the, the test that has failed is not too informative. So I go back to the, to the, to the script and change the, the message that, that it's issuing. It's saying, okay, it's, uh, the JSON in your, in, your, uh, in your web service is not right, whatever. I, I try to make it as informative as possible, right? So that they know exactly in which uh, step uh, they have failed. I'm also checking presence of files and directives in, in the repo. They have to do something like, uh, first they have to deploy to a pass, like, like Heroku, then they have to deploy to, uh, to uh, another different uh, pass using containers. So I have to check whether there, there is a Docker file, for instance. Then eventually uh, they, they have to submit something uh, using, using some deployment tool like Fabric or Capistrano or whatever. Uh, so I have to check whether th there is an actual file that does that. Uh, I have to check whether there is a vagrant file. I have to check wh wh whether there is a readme.md. All those files, I check it, right? At the very beginning, I check three things. First thing is they have a readme. Second thing is they have a license because this is all free software. So whatever they do, I tell them from the get-go that it's free software. So they have to understand that it is free and they have to respect the license and everything. So there must be a license file. And then they, have a, they, they must have a dot git ignore file because it, it's, it's, it's something saying and it's a best practice for. Uh, so that, that's, that's kind of the thing you do. You, you can see all that in the directory. And then I get the readme and I tell them, you have to tell me where is your Docker file in Docker Hub using this format. You have to tell me where you have deployed your, uh, your project using this format, right? And I extract everything from that. So if they, uh, if they tell me, I have deployed to Heroku in this address. So I, I extract that using, using uh, regular expression from the readme, and I check it. I go to Heroku, I check it, right? Using uh, LW, uh, LWB simple, right? Test fails, sometimes fails, for many different reasons. First reason is that usually people are not acquainted with this kind of thing. They, uh, 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 for, for your students, they have never used test. They have never used Travis. They have never used Git, which is absolutely appalling. Actually, the first assignment is they have to open an account in GitHub and modify the file and do it with Git. So sometimes I have to give it. They don't know what's a web service, so they, they are in the last year of their undergrads, they have no fucking idea of what's web service. So they, they tell me, so it's like the web. I, I know PHP. I say, mm, no, <laughs> just not so. I mean, they, they, they have all, ki all kind of things. Besides, you know, this is a Perl script that's, uh, that's in, a, in a directory. And you can actually put that Perl script into your own thing, right? There is only one student that has done that. Only one. The rest hasn't done a single thing. They, they haven't realized that there's a per script they can check to see everything that happens. Uh, anyway, it's, it's no big deal. It's already in the, in the uh, description of the assignment. They say you have to uh, include this in the readme file. You, have to, uh, you need to have this, this thing. You, but uh, I mean, at the end of the day, they're using this as an actual test for their assignment. So that they are actually throwing it, you know, like, like a spaghetti to the, to the ceiling to see whether it, it sticks or not, right? I do scraping. Why do I do scraping? Because at, at the beginning, uh, something they had to do is they had to actively use milestones and issues. Milestones, issues, and commits. So they had to put every issue in a milestone. They had to close every single issue using a commit. So they had to organize the project, as I said, in the beginning, in real life, right? So at the beginning, I was, uh, I was intending to use uh, GitHub API. But you probably know that uh, if you are using, if you are doing a pull request in Travis, you can't use environment variables because there could be, it could be a security hole. So I can't use any kind of uh, environment variables to use my, my API, I mean, my, my GitHub API token so that I check the, the GitHub API. So instant API using scraping. I check milestones and issues and commits. It's relatively simple. So, for instance, you get the milestone info. It's just a very simple regular expression. So you get if it's, uh, the, uh, if it's open or if it's closed or whatever. Then, 
Uh, you can see this very well. But anyway, it, it, I mean, this is in, the, in my repository too. Anyway, what, what I do is also uh, scrape the milestone page, I scrape the, the issues page, I scrape the commit page, and I extract whether it's actually, uh, whether, or whether an issue has been actually closed by a commit or not. All that using very simple uh, regular expression. Then I have to check IPs, I have to check REST APIs, I have to check URLs. As I said, they have to, to uh, upload a Docker file to, to Docker Hub, so I have to check whether it's actually there, whether it's working, whether it's exact, uh, actually been built. This is actually a log. You see that uh, they are cloning, whatever, uh, milestone one, milestone two, milestone three, then whatever. I think this is actually, uh, you see that the URLs, uh, this is Amazon URL, this is uh, uh, save.co URL, Heroku URL must be up there. So. Uh, all that is done. You have to do things like this. You have to check, uh, what I tell them is you have to deploy a, a web service and uh, what they do with the web services is, is uh, they have to, to, they need to have a root that's a status that returns, okay, of course, most people, not most people, but a lot of people, what they do is they deploy a single ser a web service that does only that. So it's a, si a web service with a single root. So I will we have to think about that next year. So maybe, maybe do some kind of, of I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe describe using, using uh, uh, what's the name of that thing they used to describe with services? That's not GraphQL, it's, it's uh, open, open API? No. Yes, open, open API. API. So, uh, a Swagger, that's the thing. So uh, what I'm going probably to tell them next year is, is uh, I'm going to, to try to, to do a small hackathon from the very, very beginning so that they program the, the web service with many different web services, they test them and everything, and uh, I will tell them to describe it uh, using Swagger. But for the time being, uh, the only thing they have to do is to deploy it using a status, which, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy for them. Uh, they really have to, to so uh, they, they have to really do, do that. And, and for, for them, it, it's something that they have never done before. And, and I mean, my, my subject, my class is not about web services, it's about the cloud. So I have to kind of, you know, teach them all kind of different things they need to do to, to do a cloud policy. And this is something I do that was, uh, was actually very nice. I, I, uh, they, have, they have to uh, use Amazon, uh, AWS or, or Azure for, for deploying a, a virtual machine. They have to tell me the, the IP of the virtual machine. I have to check that actually the virtual machine is, is working. So uh, I use NetPing which is incredibly nice, just a couple of things. I use uh, port 22 because that's a port that actually has to be running. Y you need to, to at least that port so that you can connect from, from, from outside. Actually, what, uh, they have a limited amount of resources on Azure and, and AWS, and what they do is as soon as, as it passes the test, they turn it down, and, and that's it. So they, they save money, and they can use the rest of the money you know, to mine Bitcoin or whatever. Well, thing is, says me, a lot of time. So it actually is really, really helpful for me. When, when I get something that's correct, I know that it's got all the basic things that have to be there. So I can go to the beach, it's 40 kilometers away from my home. I can spend the day there. I can dip my toes in the water. Actually, this house over here belongs to the former queen of Belgium. It's called Villa Astrid, uh, belonged to the, to the the, the former king of, of Belgium actually died there. And I have got an apartment there, and there uh, I'm going to, to, to be not moving because, uh, you know, uh, I live in the, in the city, but I go from time to time to check if it's, it's actually been built because it's not been built yet. So I go there, I go to the beach, spend a Saturday with my wife and my daughters. I couldn't do that before. I literally couldn't do that before. I mean, it saves hours, literally hours. But I'm the professor, and the whole point of doing this kind of thing is not for the professor to go to the beach. Could be, but it's not. Is it good for the student? That's a very important thing. That's, uh, whenever you do something in class, that's the, the first thing and last thing you have to ask. Is it good for the students? Are they learning more? So this is a graph of the number of students that have actually turned in a milestone, right? This is this year. This and this were the two previous years. This is the number of students, right? So 
In, uh, let's look at this one, for instance. I started with uh, around 55 students. Second milestone goes down. Third milestone goes down. Last milestone goes even downer. I was, the students were dropping out of, this, of the class. They just said, no, no, this is not for me. I can't. I can't possibly do this. So it's not something I, I can do. Last year, it was like this. I had less students because, of course, <laughs> some of them that told me, the subject is just impossible. I can't do that. So I got, I got about half the students uh, this year. This year, I got even less. <laughs> but I said, OK, I, I got to do something. But you see that the drop, dropout rate, the decaying rate of the number of students is very, very, very mild. You are going to have, you are going to always have students that drop out for reasons that are, are completely unrelated to, to your subject. Because sometimes they are, uh, this is the, uh, in Spain, the degrees are four years. I get the students, a lot of them, who still have classes and subjects from first year. Algebra, physics, because of course, you need physics to do a web page or to do a web service. You have to first, you know, put electricity into the, those damn chips and, you know, all kinds of things. Some of them have some reason. I mean, algebra is difficult, but, but they make no, absolutely no... I, I, I'm telling this because my daughters are, are doing computer science in my same school. So I know from first hand what, the, what they do. Anyway. I got some, many students who have subjects from other years, so, so they have to, to go to exams, they have to turn in assignments, and they just say, okay, I, I just can't can do this. We also, we also have a Telegram group, and I actively, okay, I, I'm going to put this mildly. After every milestone, if, if I see that the student hasn't turned in his, his, uh, his milestone, I, I ask him, uh, what's the matter? Is something wrong with you? Uh, do you need help? Please come by, get to my, get to my uh, uh, office, we can talk, whatever. I have been able to, to save some of them uh, using that. So I'm not going to say that this is precisely because of what I've been doing, but it probably helps. Funny thing is I also use uh, Perl for this. Do you have everything in the repository? So what I have done, I have, I have uh, published to Sipan uh, this, uh, this module. It's called uh, git repo commits. Uh, it's only to, to examine the commits. So uh, what I examine is, is the author of the commit, the date of the commit, or whatever. So I can get very nice statistics of what's going on in, in my. And, and this is also, uh, uh, in general, this is called learning analytics. It's something that mm, lots of people talk about, very, very few people do, do precisely because uh, the problem is that the platform that people are using, which is Moodle, usually doesn't allow you to do this. Moodle has a very nice uh, API. Most universities, for security reasons, they close the API. In my university, it's even better because they close the API for everyone in the university, but they open it for a bank that has created the official app for my university. That's why I'm not going to name it. I'm not proud of that. Just imagine, no single professor, no single student, no single staff in the university can access the notes in the Moodle using the Moodle API, but the database of grades of every single student in the university is open to a bank. Because, of course, that's not a security issue, because banks are so fucking secure. Anyway, my point was that you can do learning analytics on Moodle, at least in my university. I can do very easily learning analytics using this uh, Perl module, which is, which is available in, in CPAN. I just, I, I just uh, released version 0 0.1.0. So I got, for instance, I, I check the milestone, which is basically a file. I check the commits. I see who has been the committer. And I can count the number of, of authors. I can count the date, whatever. I see things like this. How many modifications of the file have been done? This year, this particular year, where we're having to do this is in green. The others are, are, in, uh, are in blue and red. So the, the two previous ones. What do we see here? At the beginning, people were doing lots of changes. I mean, every, every person was doing lots of changes. Why? Usually because of conflicts. They were getting, still getting the hand of the, of, the, of the system. They did conflict. 
This year, that does, didn't happen. There were no conflicts, because remember, I was checking that they were only doing a single line. So conflicts are almost, almost impossible. It can happen if there is some race condition, so that, that there is a pull request, and there is another pull request, another pull request. I haven't accepted the first one, so the third one might be in conflict, but um, it usually doesn't happen. In that case, usually I also fix it myself. But as you proceed with the number of milestones, this is the last one, you see that people uh, this year, this particular year, are doing more resubmissions. Why? Because they are submitting, they say that it fails, and they are doing it again, and again, and again, until it works, right? That's good. I mean, why not? They, they are learning. They are learning in the process. They are submitting something. They are saying, this doesn't work. So without compromising their grade, they are improving, and they are learning. So uh, that, that, that's something, uh, uh, it's, it's a point I want to, to stress a lot. For most people, evaluation is just grading. Evaluation is learning. You have to create the process of evaluation so that people actually learn with it. You can just say, I'm going to do this exam in October, and then in February I give you the grade. That's impossible. You don't learn anything out of that. Whatever you were doing there, you completely forgot. In this case, they are learning while they are. They, they have this epiphany, OK, I'm doing this wrong. In many cases, they are purely mechanic things, like you know, the, the, the URL is not inserted correctly, but in some cases they actually start to understand what they, uh, was requested from, from them. And they are doing that through the test process. And this is a little bit difficult to explain, but let me see if I get it right. First thing, once again green is this year, uh, red and blue, previous years, right? Don't look at the dates. The, uh, the calendar has changed anything. Don't look at the dates. Look, look at the shape of the card. First of this year, that meant that one day before the, the deadline, they started to turn in the assignment. There's a few of them. The day of the assignment, they did bulk of them were, were submitting it. And then after the assignment, of course, some people did it. They, they can do that. I, I'm kind of flexible with, with the dates. So if they turn it like a one day late, two day late, whatever, uh, I say, okay, but it doesn't matter. If they do it one week late, I say, I, I will put a penalty of one point, but it's no big deal. But the shapes previously were very, 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 you know, sharp. This year, what happened? People, and, and this is just one milestone, it was the last one, but it, it pretty much happens everywhere. What you see is that people start to submit assignments way before the deadline. Why? Because they want to have time to fix it before it's actually graded. So they say, okay, I'm going to do this one week before, even two weeks before the assignment. I will just do it. If, if it's wrong, I don't care. The test is going to tell me if it's wrong. It's not going to go through to the, to the professor who, who is going to tell me, no, no, this fails. So you have to turn it again, right? Check it out. I mean, the, this is December 15th, so that I think that the deadline was December 21st, so it's pretty much around here. Then during Christmas, people were doing, uh, turning in things. Then eventually there was another, another uh, peak here. So people were doing it whenever they, they you know, saw it fit. So they were using it in their, they were incorporating the thing in the learning process. And they were also trying to do things so that, so that they could have time to fix everything. They were learning much better. They were, they were organizing their time much better. Learning outcomes were, for me, very, very good. And actually, the students told me that. So I asked them, whenever I, I, when they, have, they have to turn in a milestone, I always, I, I always uh, do a survey. I, I ask them what they feel, what they feel about the, the way of doing class, what they feel about the subject, uh, whether they think that it's going to be useful for them or not. But in the last one, I asked them what, what they thought about this system. Uh, this says, it's not complete, but uh, what it says is, it helped me to submit something that's correct already. You remember when you were a student, you put it some assignment or whatever, you were waiting for the grades. Maybe one week, two weeks, one month, whatever, maybe, maybe before the final exam. That was absolutely appalling. People, people were, you know, stressed out because before the final exam, they didn't know whether, when they do this, except if they are actively trying to cheat, they know that they are going to get six uh, out of ten, six or seven or eight out of ten. They know that in the very moment that they have turned meaning. So th that's the thing that they, they like a lot. They say, it complicates my life. Four of them said that, or of 
20 students, I can understand that. But sometimes it complicates the life that, you know, it's, it's no big deal. It's, it's because they, they, they didn't read the, the, the specifications correctly, so they, they, they put the URL in a, in a wrong place or whatever. It helps me, uh, I think this one, it helps me to, uh, uh, to be sure of the grade I have. So that, that's another of the, the value. So they, 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 feel, they feel empowered with, with this kind of thing. So it, they don't feel disenfranchised, like this is a machine, a machine is turning things, because after that I have to grade. But when I grade, I know that pretty much everything is in its place. Semester is over now. It's not over, actually, yesterday and today I'm still getting, because I, in Spain we have a, a regular exam and then we have a special exam. So some people who have failed because they, they didn't turn in the, their milestone on time, they are still, so yesterday I, I had to accept like four or five pull requests, and today also a couple. So I got stuff to do. So I got my assignments for, for myself. First one is I want to create a SIPA module. Why? Several reasons. First reason is I don't want the code to be in the same repository so that some, some smart student uh, can you know look at the at the code so they will have to go another steps maybe to go to to the to the, to, to CPAN and see what what's going on and anyway uh, uh, the problem is that I have two subjects and I, it was all hacked together so I have a lot lot of common code for the master I have I have one script for the other I have one script I, I was moving things back and forth not nice I also want to do test of the code so right now the test was the first student was submitting the, the assignment I told him okay hold on there. Is everything okay? <laughs> I need to check this. It's okay. It's okay. So I usually get them a, a beta tester grade and also stickers because everyone loves the stickers. <laughs> everyone loves grades too, but stickers are nice. Then I want to stand test. I mean, think about it. You can do pretty much everything. You can check. You can do spell check. I don't know if I want to do this because <laughs> spell check is going to be just terrible. I can actually t check the commits. So I, I can check uh, whether they are, they are doing the whole thing, like milestones and comments and everything. I should check uh, using uh, uh, Swagger, the full REST API, so that they have to declare uh, the rules or whatever. Check for plagiarism. I have found lots of students who cheat. You know, people do that all the time. OK, I'm, I'm out to be, to be done. Lessons learned. You have to innovate, but only to improve the student, the student experience. You don't have to innovate to save time. It's good, but you have to do it to improve student, student experience. And you have to check if, if it does. No, you look at the students, they seem happy, they smile, you know, they like the stickers. No, 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 you actually have to ask them anonymously whether you are doing okay or not. Little scripting goes a long way. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>